In this video, we'll discuss truncation errors and the total numerical error. Here's the agenda for today. We'll start with truncation errors. The last topic is about the total error, which combines round-off and truncation errors. In the last video, we discussed some error metrics and round-off errors. Please watch that video before proceeding if you haven't already. Round-off errors come from the computer's precision limitations. On the other hand, truncation errors come from making a numerical approximation. One of the classic examples of truncation error stems from the Taylor and McLaren series, which you likely studied in your calculus class. The McLaren series is actually a special case of the Taylor series, but both of them have an infinite number of terms. If we were to write a code to implement one of them, we'd have to stop somewhere. When we stop, the things we've ignored by not continuing are truncated, and therefore we're missing something. That's the truncation error in a nutshell. Another example is approximating derivatives. We're going to cover this in much more detail later on in the course, but here's a preview. Given a data set, we can approximate the derivative of this data using this formula here. This general class of problems is called a finite difference method, and this specific equation is called a forward difference because it uses the xy coordinate one point in front of our point of interest, i. As you'll see when we study this in more depth, this formula is actually derived from the Taylor series, so it's no wonder it's also a source of truncation error. Let's take a closer look at the Taylor series. The Taylor series is of great value in numerical methods because it enables us to approximate any smooth function as a polynomial, which we can then use to estimate what happens in the future. From your calculus class, you should know that the Taylor series can have anywhere from 1 to infinity terms depending on when you choose to truncate the expansion. Let's understand the Taylor series by using a practical example, building up the expansion term by term. Suppose you're blindfolded and taken to a location on the side of a hill facing downslope. The thick black line here represents the hill. You're standing at location xi, and your elevation at xi is f of xi. Let's say you're standing on a completely horizontal platform and you're asked to predict the elevation at a position x sub i plus 1, which is a distance h, away from you. Since you're standing blindfolded on a horizontal platform, you have no idea that the hill slopes downwards. Your best guess is to assume that the elevation at this point is the same as your current elevation. Mathematically, this means that f of x sub i plus 1 equals f of x sub i. This is called a zero-with-order approximation because we didn't use any derivatives in our guess. Intuitively, this might be a good guess if h is really small. If our hill was actually a flat surface, our guess would yield the exact answer because the surface wouldn't change heights. That's clearly not the case, so we have room for improvement. Now you're allowed to take your right foot off the platform and place it at x of i plus 1. You can immediately sense that your right foot is lower than your left foot, which is still anchored on the platform. Now you can obtain a quantitative estimate of the slope by measuring the difference in elevation and dividing it by the distance between your feet. With this additional information, you're quite literally in a better position to predict the height at this point. In essence, you use the slope estimate to project a straight line out to x sub i plus 1. You can express this prediction mathematically with this formula here. This is called a first-order approximation because this new term over here consists of the first derivative multiplied by the step size h. Now you're capable of predicting an increase or decrease of the function between x sub i and x sub i plus 1. You can take even more steps to obtain an even better estimate, and eventually you get close enough to the true slope of the hill. The practical value of Taylor series expansions is that including only a few terms will yield an approximation that's close enough to the true value. How many terms you need to include depends on a variety of factors. A major factor is our step size, h. We can choose how far away from x we want to evaluate f of x, and that choice can greatly influence the truncation error. The qualitative comparison of truncation errors is given by big O notation. Whenever you see a numerical method being used, it'll likely have some mention of the truncation error. For example, take the two-point forward difference method, which was shown a couple of slides ago. We say it has truncation error on the order of h, which means that the truncation error is proportional to our step size. If we have h, we'll have the truncation error. On the other hand, the three-point forward difference method has error on the order of h squared. If we have h, our truncation error will be quartered. 
By the way, all of these were derived from truncating the Taylor series at different points in the expansion, which, once again, we'll see when we get to numerical differentiation. You can observe from the general trend that adding more terms from the expansion yields a more accurate answer, which makes sense. But if you have more terms, the computer needs to perform more calculations. This can be computationally expensive if you have a massive data set. This can also be detrimental because doing more calculations increases the risk of round-off errors. Finding the balance between computation time, round-off error, and truncation error is an art. You have to experiment with a bunch of numerical methods and step sizes to get a good feel for how they all interact. It's kind of like starting a diet. You can't take a BuzzFeed quiz to find the one diet that'll magically make you drop 20 pounds. You have to slowly try different foods over a long period of time to gauge how certain foods affect your body. So I just said that understanding the interplay between round-off errors and truncation errors is mainly a matter of experimentation. Thankfully, there are some guidelines we can follow. First, we should understand the total numerical error. The total numerical error is the summation of the round-off and truncation errors. In general, the only way to minimize round-off errors is to increase the number of significant figures of the computer. Furthermore, we've noted that the round-off error may increase due to subtractive cancellation or due to an increase in the number of computations in our analysis. In contrast, we just learned that the truncation error can be reduced by decreasing the step size. Because a decrease in step size can lead to things like subtractive cancellation or an increase in computations, the truncation errors are decreased as the round-off errors are increased. Therefore, we have a big dilemma. The strategy for decreasing one component of the total error leads to an increase in the other component. In the computation, we could conceivably decrease the step size to minimize the truncation errors, only to discover that in doing so, the round-off error begins to dominate the solution and the total error grows. Thus, our remedy becomes our problem. One classic challenge in numerical methods is determining an appropriate step size for our particular computation. We would like to choose a large enough step size to decrease the number of calculations and round-off errors without incurring the penalty of a large truncation error. Identifying that point of diminishing returns where the round-off error begins to negate the effects of step size reduction is tricky. Such situations are relatively uncommon when using MATLAB because of its 15 to 16 digit precision, but you should still be cognizant of the fact that they can occur. For most practical cases, we don't know the exact error associated with the employed numerical method. The exception is when we know the exact solution, which makes our numerical approximations unnecessary. Therefore, for most engineering problems, we must settle for some estimate of the error in our calculations. Here's some more guidelines to help reduce the total error. Before you start coding, you should understand the physical processes and mathematical models you're using. Most models employ a series of simplifying assumptions, which can inherently contribute to truncation errors. You can use the Taylor series to obtain a rough theoretical estimate of the model's error for some very simple applications. Once you start coding, you should try avoiding subtractive cancellation. If you're working with a bunch of big and small numbers together, operate on the smaller numbers first to avoid loss of significance. Another great strategy is to place intermediate checks in your code. You can make the code stop halfway through if your errors are already too big. Once you're done coding, you should be prepared to perform numerical experiments to increase your awareness of computational errors and possible ill-conditioned problems. Such experiments may involve repeating the computations with a different step size or method and comparing their results. We may employ sensitivity analysis to see how our solution changes when we change model parameters or model inputs. We could also try different numerical algorithms that have different theoretical foundations, are based on different computational strategies, or have different convergence properties and stability characteristics. We'll do all of this throughout the class to fully understand the gamut of numerical methods. When you graduate and get a job, you might be designing some part or structure that directly impacts humans, the environment, the economy, or have other high-stakes ramifications. In these critical scenarios, it might be appropriate to have an outside agency solve the same problem so you can compare the results. Here's a brief summary of the two videos in this sequence. The purpose of numerical methods is to estimate something because we don't know it exactly. By the definition of an estimation, we're going to introduce some errors into our analysis. You can do all the fancy theoretical math write a dissertation on a variation of your favorite numerical method, or model every physical phenomenon known to mankind in MATLAB. 
but if you don't know how the errors affect your approximation, your work is trash. As we saw in the Vancouver Stock Exchange, seemingly small errors can lead to large-scale disasters. There are two main types of errors, round-off and truncation. Round-off errors arise because of the way computers digitally represent numbers. Truncation errors arise because we use an approximation in lieu of the exact thing. There's a trade-off between the two that can really only be fully understood through experimentation. Keep the concept of errors in your mind as we move throughout the semester. Although we don't spend much time on this topic overall, it's arguably the most pertinent. We'll revisit many of these concepts later on. For instance, we might ask you to use two different methods and compare the results. Thanks for watching, I hope you learned from this video sequence, and I'll see you soon.